I'm Exo, and in this video, we're going to dive into some of the features and functionality that we've added to the front end side of Exodus version 6. Uh, the first one is going to be how we handle all the extras that we add to each game. So if we go to a game that has extras like, let's say, The Secret of Monkey Island, uh, it used to be when you clicked on the game, I'm going to hold off because it's going to start playing music when I do, you would click on the game, you'd right click, it would bring up the little right click menu, and then you'd have to go to media, and then under here you'd see documents, and um, you'd have a list of all the different things we had scanned for that game. Uh, the change makes sense from LaunchBox's point of view, in terms of organizing the right click menu. However, I was concerned that it was burying uh, a lot of our work into menus that some people may never find. So Timber, uh, over on our Discord channel, one of my staff members, created an amazing plugin that moves it down here to the English Extras. Now, the first thing you're going to notice is there is a flag for America in this case, and it says English. Why? Because as we start adding new language packs to Exodus, their Extras will be in their own menu, so it's not all bundled together. Timber is also leading up uh, the GLP, as we call it. That's the German language pack. So once, the, if you were to download that and use the merge utility to add it to Exodus version 6, you would have a, another entry there. I don't know if he went with uh, Deutsch extras or German extras or if it's all in German. Uh, that'll be up to him how he wants to do it, but it will have a little German flag next to it as well. Now what you're seeing is a automatically generated menu. It's querying a folder, the extras folder for this game, and in real time populating this. So if I was to go copy a file into that folder and then go back and right click again, it would now be updated with a new file that wasn't there before. So what kind of files do we have? We have scans from the CD version, the user guide, registration card, quick start cards, even the license agreement. Last year, Frank Savaldi at the Video Game History Foundation interviewed Ron Gilbert and as part of that they released some design documents that explained how the game came to be. And so we've got all those added now. Um, we're on a Timber kick right now. Timber is also responsible for this. Uh, some of the games back in the day had what you call a code wheel. Um, the idea was for copy protection. You couldn't copy a code wheel because it was interactive. And that also made it hard to preserve it. So Timber has found every code wheel that we can possibly identify, taken them, we've gotten them scanned, we use HTML, and when you click on it, you have a interactive code wheel. You can grab the front, move it around, you can click and move the back around. So the way this would have worked in Monkey Island is as you started the game, it would show you a picture of a pirate. And let's say it was the zombie head with the monkey face. You would turn to that. And then it might say, in what year did this, this pirate live in Antigua? And you come down here and you see it says 1668. You would type that in the game and you're off to go. You can play now. This would have been very difficult to copy back in the day as you would have had to copy. First, you'd have to take the wheel apart. And then you have to copy both the front and the back. And you would have to, you'd have to cut out the little holes perfectly on the front side. It, it's a pain. So it was great copy protection. Uh, hard for pre preservation purposes. But thanks to Timber, uh, we now have interactive code wheels. Um, now we did have a couple in version 5, but we have added quite a bit more since then. We've also got hint books, reference cards. Uh, a lot of cool stuff in here for the game. Now... Another really neat feature that we have is if we come over here, we can go to our main list and we now have genre selections that are much more in-depth than before. If I click on the filter, and first we're going to stop the Monkey Island music, uh, you can see I, I go to genre and some of my genres have a little call out that will pop out. Uh, previously, all puzzle games were puzzle games. And if you wanted to find falling block puzzles, uh, so Tetris clones, you would go to puzzle games and then go to the series field and go down to series and there's like a, a series called genre and there was a colon and falling block puzzle. 
Uh, one of the harder ones to search was sports games. Uh, all games were sports that were sports, but then if you wanted to go to a football game, you had to scroll down the series field, go to sports, and then pick football. What we discovered recently is that by adding a forward slash to the genre field in more recent copies of LaunchBox, it actually creates a submenu. So now if I click on this, every football game, American football, uh, loads up immediately without having to go to the series field first. It's catching up. There it goes. Uh, you can see what this looks like by looking over here, and you can see sports forward slash football helps create this menu for us. Uh, this allows us to do much more granular selection without burying uh, stuff in the series field, which has gotten pretty in-depth over the years. Uh, when we have over 7,600 games, you can imagine how many series that means we have out there. Let's go ahead and clear that. Another really cool thing we have is dynamic playlists. So if I go to the playlist field and I click on 3D effects, these games... Let's go to Blood, for example, one of my favorites. I live again. Yes, you do. That should be the uh, the motto of Exodus. Das is I live again. Uh, you can see we have a playlist that says 3D effects over here in the uh, series field. Any game that has that playlist added to that series added to it will be on this playlist. You can see it's also on the Gravis Ultrasound playlist, the Remote Multiplayer playlist, and the Sound Canvas playlist. Now the big benefit here is as we add stuff to the game. All right, that's enough of you. Let's see here. As we've added stuff to the game, we can just add that field without touching your playlist through the updater, and boom, all your playlists are updated. Now we have some new playlists that than we used to have. One of them is games with printer support. This is really neat. Using DOSBox X, we can set it up so that the game thinks you have a printer, and it's really just forwarding your printer data to your PDF writer. So you can go into Print Shop or Alf's Party Kit and make a birthday invitation and hit print in the game, and your Windows PDF writer printer will pop up, ask you where you want to save the file, you save it there, and then you can go open that file and print it on any printer you want. You can print it on a real one. And so I actually... Um, recently printed out about 20 sheets of paper with ALF stationery and used them to make notes at work. And people's faces when I handed them notes or things with ALF on them, it was funny. They, I think they thought I went back and bought some old stationery off Etsy or something. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, it's a neat addition. And there's some. we're still identifying every game that has printer support. You can see there's only eight right now. There's obviously plenty more that have it. However, it has to be a game that we can use with DOSBox X, and it has to be something that you would print that makes sense. For example, SimCity 1 has printer support, so you could print out your city. Um, unfortunately, a couple things there. One, it also supports different sound cards, which uh, would mean changing it from the version of DOSBox that sounds best. And then also, uh, in my testing, it printed out these lots of little sheets of paper, and it's looking... It doesn't quite understand how 8 by 11 sheets work. It wants to do like a banner, a poster size thing. <laughs> Another cool uh, playlist we have that is a new feature is our Real Magic games. Now the Real Magic was an add-on card for your computer that was a MPEG uh, upgrade. Basically, the power of decoding in your DOS machine would have been fairly low. So you had a lot of artifacting in a lot of FNV games. Now, it wasn't uncommon in console games. Uh, console players, like the CDI, for example, had an MPEG chip that was added onto it. The 3DO had an MPEG chip. Uh, all the multimedia consoles had these MPEG chips that allowed them to play higher quality MP MPEG files. To get one of these for DOS, the first problem was they didn't make them for very long. The second problem was they made a megaton of different versions some were compatible, some weren't, uh, with different games. You also had to buy games specifically designed to work with your MPEG card. Now, currently we've only got eight. There are a few more out there. They're being located. Now, the thanks to this project can go towards a fellow on the Vogons forums who developed a, an emulator after years of people looking for this to make it work. And then the guys over at DOSBox Staging 
have taken that and integrated it, cleaned it up a little bit, and made it really nicely functional. Now you'll notice if we go to a game like Return to Zork, it is going to be called Return to Zork and then uh, Real Magic Version. You can see down here in parentheses. That's because the regular Return to Zork is also on the main games list. If I go to All Games and I click on Return to Zork, you'll see I have it twice. The first one is the standard version that was already in the pack, has been for years. And then we have the real magic version here. Now the primary difference is that the real magic version is going to have much clearer video in it. Uh, there's some other little higher res things as well. Uh, because the video is higher res, it also allows some of the menus that pop up over the video to be higher resolution. It's a great way to experience some of your favorite games or if you've never played it before, a way to play it in what is likely at least on the PC, uh, the best way to play the game. We also have a playlist for installed Exodus games. Now this one's important because when you have 7600 some odd games on your computer, maybe you only want to go to the ones that you have already set up. You'll see here I've got two games already installed. If I was to go over to all, and let's see, we'll come down here and uh, Let's see here. We have, we're in soundtracks right now. I've got it. There we go. Let's add Alice in Wonderland here. I'm going to double click on it. When I double click on a game, I'm telling LaunchBox I want to play it. Since the game is not installed, my files are going on the back end and saying, okay, well, it's not here yet. Do you want to install it? Now, I'm going to click this off and show you if I right click on the game and go to configure, that's installing without asking. It's already done. It's such a small game. Now, games have global settings now. Instead of every game having its own setting, whether you want full screen or windowed is now a global option. The resolution of your desktop, which will define how big your window is, is now a global option and so is aspect ratio. This means during setup, it does not have to go through and edit 7,000 configuration files anymore. It does it one time and every game defers to the settings in that global file. I'm going to hit no, I don't want to change them. I'm not going to change my graphics filter either. And now when I go to my installed games, you can see Alice in Wonderland is ready to be played. Now, if I right click on this game and I click configure, I get the install menu again. However, at this point, I can configure settings or uninstall. If I click C to configure settings, I can go and change the global settings for that game without uninstalling it first. Now I'm going to go ahead and uninstall to show you another new feature we have. What I like to back up my saves and game settings. At this point, if I click yes, it's going to take a difference of the game directory, compare it to the original zip file I installed from, and every file that has been modified since then will get zipped up and stored in a save folder. I'm going to hit yes here. It's creating the diff right now. Now, the game has disappeared because it has uninstalled. If I go and reinstall that game, so let's go to, uh, I'll type in Alice up here, we'll switch to all, I'm going to right click and configure, it automatically asks me, hey, you've already backed up data for this game, do you want to restore it? If I click yes here, it's going to go grab that file, well first it's going to uninstall the game, and then it's going to grab the files that I've backed up, and overwrite the files in the game directory with them. So that means you're going to get your save games. Uh, if you've gone into a game and changed the key bindings or the sound settings, that's all going to get overwritten and replaced with your settings so you don't have to go restore it every single time. Or you can hit D and that'll just delete your save and it'll stop prompting you. So maybe you accidentally said yes and you don't like those settings. You can get rid of them. I'm going to do that now. I've deleted it and it's going to move forward ask me about my global settings and if I go back to installed it is here again. Let's go ahead and remove that one. Now another option here is with games like Doom. Doom was problematic previously. Let's go ahead and get that installed while I'm talking to you. Because the sound settings were stored in the same file that the key bindings were set into. Now the problem with that is every time you launch the game it would ask you 
what type of sound did you want? And by choosing that sound, the process was grabbing a new sound file that had that configuration and writing it into the game folder. So those of you who had gone in and changed key bindings were losing your settings every time. We had to fix that. So now when I play Doom, and the menu pops up for me, you'll see here I can launch setup. Now I'm going to pick Sound Blaster for this one. Launch the game. I'm in Doom. We're going to quit. And I'm going to hit, yep. Close down. I'm going to launch Doom again. Now, last time I picked Sound Blaster. This time it says, hey, you picked Sound Blaster 16 last time. Do you want to change it? If I hit no, then everything's going to launch with the exact same settings that I used last time. Your data will not get overwritten. If I hit yes, I go back to the menu and I can select a new sound card. I can launch setup. If I go to setup here, it's the same setup you used to get back in DOS. I can configure my controller. I can rebind my keys or turn mouse on. I can save the parameters, launch the game. When I come in next time, I'm not going to lose those settings when I pick a new sound card. I'm going to hit play here. And boom. It says Sound Blaster 16, but it also has whatever settings I changed last time. I'll close that out. We'll go ahead and hit configure. Uninstall. I can back up my save if I want. That way... Or the other great thing about the backup save is if you go to that save folder, they're named the exact same name as the game. So if you have Exodus on multiple computers, you can go do a backup like this, grab that, copy to every computer, now you have your save file, your key bindings on any computer you want. If you have gotten to a point in a game and you want to share that with another friend, email them the file. They put it in their save folder, they install the game, they hit yes, they want to go ahead and install the backup, and they're going to have your settings. It's a pretty neat feature. We're going to go ahead and say no to that, let it run. There we go. That covers the majority of what has been newly added. We did create a new playlist here for PC Junior games. Uh, these are games that use the machine type PC Junior when you launch them. We are currently doing a full-blown overhaul on games that use CGA Composite thanks to Python, uh, an invaluable member over on the Discord uh, and part of the project. As soon as we get that done, we'll make a video specifically about CGA Composite and covering all the cool things that that does. This is phase one, layer one, of all the cool new things built into the front end. We have other stuff too. Some of it's still in, still being finalized before our release. And we don't want the video to get too long here and too much buried in one place. So I'm going to end this video with all that information. I hope everyone enjoys using the pack as much as I've enjoyed building it. The idea here is to really create something that is not just preservation through playability, but it's fun to use. If you've got family mode turned on, your kids can get in here and they can browse, they can look for things, they can make birthday invitations with ALF and print them out, they can go to remote multiplayer and play a game against their brother or sister or you in the other room. Um, I can't tell you how much fun working on this has been for me and it's a testament. We are going on 15 years or I'm going on 15 years of working on Exodus myself. Uh, the Discord channel started about five years ago, and that's really the kickoff point where this became a community project. I would not be doing this after 15 years if I didn't have an extreme passion for it, and I didn't have so much respect for these games, and I didn't see how much everyone loved using it. Uh, the community has been wonderful. It, it, this would still be a little personal pack of 300 games on my computer if it wasn't for the interest and the passion of those who use it. So thank you to everyone on my Discord channel, especially my team, who have helped me improve this by so much, way beyond what I could have ever done by myself. That is our first look at new features for Exodus version 6. Thank you for joining me.